hello everybody today i'll discuss about the one of the important manufacturing process that is called the metal forming process or we can say that it's a simply forming process forming process is important in the sense that in this case there is no loss of the material but we can simply take the shape by the application of the load one shape to another shape another deformed shape and of course when you try to deform one particular material it must gone through the some plastic deformation zone such that will get some kind of the permanent deformation from the initial state of the uh, any component so overall we say this is the forming process the change of the shape when you uh, uh, for a material when you plastically deform the material now therefore it's a very important to understand the uh, the how to represent the different plasticity associated with the uh, metal forming process now in this case there are two different types of the metal forming it can be bulk metal forming so bulk metal forming as a as a whole this component is deformed and converted to another shape that is called bulk deformation process another is a sheet uh, metal forming process so sheet metal forming process we try to handle the deformation procedure for a sheet metal and usually plain strain condition prevails when you try to deform the material in uh, sheet metal uh, forming operation now therefore there we have to apply the stress or apply the load and but we represent the application of the load in the metal forming process in terms of the stress so in the stress mean or maybe the strength of the material which uh, can be between the yield strength of a material and between the uh, fracture strength of a material so it, it is in between these two uh, the within the limit of the yield strength to the fracture strength so there we know that below the yield point material behaves like elastically and above the yield point material behaves the plastically so one is that uh, important thing is that although we are telling the strength can be or stress can be between yield point and the fracture strength but of course uh, in a when you try to practically uh, plastically deform the material there must be some kind of the elastic recovery of the material so some kind of the recovery will be a part of the deformation process specifically most of the engineering materials which is having the elastoplastic behavior of the particular material now the type of loading with the application it can be tensile loading it can be compressive loading it can be bending or shearing and combination any combination of the load is possible which is associated with the metal forming process now we see we understand that if the strength of the material is very high it is very difficult to deform the material or, or maybe we need some much amount of the energy to deform the material or there may be some other effect will be there so sometimes we can facilitate the deformation process with the application of the temperature so that's why based on that the condition of the temperature it can be cold forming process it can be the hot forming process so cold forming process means usually we perform the deformation operation at the room temperature and hot forming process we perform the deformation at elevated temperature uh, there might be some other temperature condition we'll discuss later on also so usually the cold and hot deforming process is usually we follow in the forming process or metal forming operation but name of the uh, forming processes is something like that that rolling process forging drawing uh, deep drawing bending and extrusion these are the different names of the metal forming processes such that this in the the way of deformation of material are di are different in all these cases we'll discuss the we'll try to get some overall understanding of the different types of the uh, common forming process but before that we there is another type of the forming operation that is called the warm forming process warm forming process is basically something between the hot forming process and cold forming process so here temperature is in between this hot and cold forming operation and in this case the warm forming is sometimes happens because in this case uh, possible reduction in the number of annealing operations due to the reduction of strain hardening so you one of the important parameter associated with metal, metal forming process is the strain hardening of the strain hardening effect of this particular material so most of the uh, applied to the bulk forming process we can we can apply the not exactly the cold forming operation rather we can apply the warm forming operation so this deformation behavior will be different uh, with respect to the cold forming operations but if you look into uh, this thing how 
this forming operation is also associated with some kind of the uh, metallurgical phenomena or some kind of the structural changes also uh, we can observe. You just take an example and if you follow this figure here, see that uh, it is a rolling operation and we deform that uh, before deformation, see we are get the almost equiac structure or maybe having some grain or grain size is relatively bigger. I can say that uh, average grain size is relatively bigger. Now, if we heat the sample with a particular temperature and then you deform the material, see at this, this particular zone, the transition zone where you can get the deformed grains, deformed and elongated grains will be there, some part and certain part which is get the favorable condition to perform the recrystallization operations with the condition of the temperature and the strain and strain rate, then it will create the fine recrystallized equiax grain kind of the structure. So, it means that we can start with the this hot forming operation we start with the initial grain size, initial grain and after deformation, deformation means the lots of energy will be stored in inside the structure, but through recrystallization the energy will be the, the stored energy will be released and it will try to find the new grains, but everything happens at solid state that means it is not reaching the melting point temperature. So, that is why uh, this in the metal forming operation recrystallization formation of the recrystallization is one of the important features associated with the any kind of the metal forming operations. Now, sometimes we perform the annealing operation just to uh, annealing operation is specialized to to create the recrystallized grains associated with the metal forming operation. So, here we see that warm forming is the one this thing only we can distinguish the warm forming operation in the term in terms of temperature. Apart from this thing we have the isothermal forming operation. So, sometimes we can kind of the some temperature sensitive material. So, maybe in that case is temperature sensitive material in the sense that if there is a some temperature gradient within the component that can create some kind of the cracking or some other phenomena uh, associated with the uh, material. So, in that case we try to follow some kind of the isothermal metal forming operation that means all forming operation is performed uh, one basically one, one constant temperature. So, it may be other than the, the room temperature process. So, these are the other variant of the this warm forming and the isothermal forming is the other variant of the uh, metal forming operations and where we can understand that metal forming operation is basically the associated with the recrystallization or store of the energy by creating large amount of the dislocation or other kind of the crystal defects associated during the deformation of the operation. So, that is why most of the in metal forming operation we try to perform some kind of the annealing operation. So, purpose of the annealing operation is just to refine the structure or the release of the stored energy which is basically stored during the deformation of this thing. So, that release of the energy is usually happens to so completely this deformed grain into the fine uh, equiax kind of the grains through recrystallization mechanism usually happens in associated with the forming operation. But of course, recrystallization there we use the recrystallization term which is most very very associated with the the metal forming operation, but this recrystallization depends on the, the temperature conditions, it depends on the how much amount of the strain or what is the, the strain rate associated with the deformation process. Based on that, we can uh, all these are the driving parameter for the recrystallization in a metal forming operation. That is why when you try to analyze the forming operations, so basically uh, we always focus on the how the material behaves plastically. So, we just look into the plastic deformation zone in a common stress strain diagram of a material and looking into the plastic behavior plastic deformation zone we try to understand that the rate or the flow behavior material flow behavior uh, during the uh, forming operation. So, sometimes we define the flow stress value, uh, flow stress value is basically instantaneous values of the uh, stress which is required to continue the deformation of a material uh, process. So, therefore, some this this that is why uh, we use the terminology flow stress value. So, this flow stress is one important parameter to link with the performance of the uh, metal forming operation. So, sometimes we, we, we are talking about the deformation can be within the plastic deformation zone. So, therefore, stress and can be related to the strain using uh, uh, this relation, this nonlinear relation. You understand that within the elastic limit, the stress is proportional to the strain in, in most of the engineering materials. So, it uh, that means stress varying linearly within the elastic limit, but beyond elastic limit if you 
follow any stress strain diagram of a material so it is usually the nonlinear so that nonlinear nonlinear behavior of the material the simple way we can relate the stress versus strain using this relation so where sigma f can be the flow stress value k is the strain coefficient depending upon the material and n is the strain hardening exponent of this particular material during the deformation process so strain hardening is another imp important parameter that decide the what is the formability of the material is basically directly linked with the strain hardening behavior of the particular material now can be drawn the flow curve based on the two stress strain diagram so we know that there is, when you analyze the stress strain diagram it can be engineering stress strain diagram it can be the true stress strain diagram so basically flow stress can be based on the true stress strain diagram is the more important in the plastic deformation zone now most of the metals at room temperature basically if you see the strength increases when deformed due to the strain hardening effect so strength actually increases because of the strain hardening effect or strain hardening effect associated with this particular material during the deformation of the uh, metals for example when you try to deform the material first plastic deformation start at the the yield point so after the yield point if you gradually deforming the material so the if you see there is increment of the strength level so what way the increment of the strain level the, the others curve in the plastic deformation zone the the stress strain the, the gradient on the stress strain curve or stress strain graph that actually represent the strain hardening uh, effect of this particular material if you see just i'm uh, trying to explain this part is a, for example this we know the stress strain diagram for a material so we use this is up to the last treatment they deform the plastic deformation zone here and now if you if you relate this plastic deformation zone sigma equal to uh, k epsilon to the power n and if you see in this case ln sigma equal to ln k plus n ln epsilon so if you plot the stress strain diagram or this 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 stress versus strain uh, in a diagram and we try to put we try to plot in the logarithm scale so here you see that y equal to this is the this is the c constant this is the slope and mx plus c so logarithm scale a and a x and y axis if you plot the strain versus uh, strain component and you see that indicates the linear fitting and the slope of this curve will be indicating the strain hardening coefficient if you see the n is the strain hardening coefficient so in the logarithm scale it uh, we plot the, the it it's maybe something like this so this slope the slope of this curve uh, the slope of this curve is basically indicating so ln uh, sigma or there might be some c effect will also be there the constant term c so the slope of this curve is basically indicating the strain hardening behavior it means that when the further application of the load what way the the strength is incrementing with respect to the strain and that in the logarithm scale if we plot it uh, this stress uh, stress versus strain and that slope of this curve indicates the strain hardening coefficient uh, for the particular material now of course when you try to look into the stress strain diagram basically we, we have we can get lots of information from stress strain diagram one is the elastic limit ultimate tensile strain elastic recovery what can be the work done what can be the strain hardening behavior just strain hardening behavior i just explained but if you look into the other aspect so elastic limit is this point so here the up to this is the yield point is this this the up to y it is the yield point strain the yield strength is this this point up to which the stress is proportional to the strain and there is a transition to the plastic deformation zone so from that point we can say this is the the yield point and then this zone the up to this this zone is the plastic deformation zone and this part is the elastic part so this up this point which part is the stress is proportional to the strain this indicates this point is the elastic limit now this indicates the ultimate what is the maximum stress value this is the ultimate tensile strain and this this point indicates the fracture strain now if you uh, calculate what is the total work done during the, because when you plot the stress versus strain diagram so basically it indicates that we are applying the load and the, 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 the deformation occurs and that deformation we represent in terms of the strain now what is the work done total work done to deform this material up to the particular strain that simply 
representing the what is the area if you calculate that area actually represents the work done uh, per unit volume in this particular case. So, we get the information from the stress strain diagram if we simply calculate what is the area of the stress strain uh, stress uh, from the stress strain diagram that indicates what is the total work done per unit volume when you deforming the material uh, up to particular strain. So, up to here we can say up to up to the um, this uh, fracture point. So, up to the fracture point what is the total amount of the work done um, the area that area indicates the what is the total work done during the deformation process. So, other way this work done also equivalent to the what is the toughness of this particular material that is also equivalent to the what is the total work done uh, during this deformation process. So, uh, but remember when you calculate the area this thing this area represent the is just simply the strain into strain uh, this is in, in terms of integral it is basically uh, the sigma into uh, d epsilon that indicates the total uh, total work done uh, total area of this particular curve but that is equivalent to the if you look into the unit this indicates the work done work done is basically the Newton per meter square unit of the stress or so I can say or Newton meter per another meter so Newton meter equal to joule per meter cube. So, work done per unit volume this is the area indicates that work done per unit volume. Now, strain thus work done and elastic recovery is something like that uh, say the any elastoplastic material if you remove the load uh, at this point. So, it will come back to the this particular position. So, here the which is slow initial which is parallel to the initial slope and this happens because the material having the material is the elastoplastic material. So, some elastic recovery will always be there. So, now how you can calculate the elastic recovery? So, this amount is the supposed to deformation up to this point, but after removing the load it will come back to this particular point. So, these are the recovery. So, we can say the elastic recovery in terms of the strain, but remaining part is the basically the plastic strain uh, 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 exist within the during the deformation process. So, that is why from the stress strain diagram we can calculate what is the elastic recovery we can find out uh, what is the total work done or we can find out what is the toughness of this material, we can find out what is the yield strength of the material, what is the ultimate tensile strength or what which point is the uh, fracture strength of this material. All kind of the information is basically we can extract from the simple stress strain diagram. Now, some understanding of this thing the plastic because we are dealing with the metal deformation process. So, a little bit understanding of the this uh, yield conditions. Uh, what we can apply uh, this uh, in, in this particular case. Now, there are two different usually two different conditions stress cause ill conditions and another one mice's ill conditions. So, here in this case stress cause ill condition is that plastic flow is basically depends on the slip which is the shearing process the plastic flow will occur which is basically uh, based on the the in the shearing condition shearing happens uh, on the on the during the deformation process. So, if we look into this aspect the based on the, the slip occurs because of the shearing action during the plastic deformation of the material, then we can apply the, the Tereska's ill condition. It is actually based on this particular principle the shearing of the uh, material during the deformation process. Now, we say that uh, condition yielding will occur when the, this the greatest shear stress reaches is particular uh, critical value. So, yielding will start when the shear stress uh, the maximum amount of the shear stress will be reaching to the some critical value. Now, in a tensile testing the maximum this the inside tensile testing we apply the load in one direction, but that is the normal stress we consider the sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, but that is sigma 1, sigma 2 indicate the normal stress value. So, therefore, the greatest maximum shear stress value in this particular uh, combination of the stress state sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 the yielding will occur when the this thing the the, the critical values of the shear stress, but critical values of the shear stress will be the half of the normal value. So, here half of the shear stress value uh, tau equal to uh, sorry half of the normal stress value. So, shear stress will be the critical value of the shear stress will be the sigma y by 2. Now, yielding will occur the maximum shear stress value. So, maximum shear stress value is the sigma 1 maximum value of the normal stress maximum minimum value of the normal stress. The difference between these two indicates the maximum values of the, the uh, stress and the divided by 2 that is indicates the maximum values of the shear stress. So, when maximum values of the shear stress is equal to critical value. So, this critical value equal to again critical values critical values of the shear stress which is equivalent to the sigma y by 2. If both equal then we can get the difference between the maximum minimum shear stress value is uh, normal stress value is equal to equivalent to the sigma y. So, this is basically 
in this indicates the the yielding conditions to happen uh, during the deformation as per the Tereshka's yield conditions. Now, if you see that yielding is, if you see that in this expression, we, we are not bothering about what is the values of the another principal stress value. So, it depends on the two principal stress value, but we, we are not, this uh, condition does not involve that the another uh, another principal stress value this thing. So, this is the, the we can say that is independent this condition is independent of the intermediate uh, principal stress value. But in case of the plane stress condition, plane stress condition we have the sigma 3 equal to 0. So, then we one component 0 and we see if sigma 1 greater than sigma 2 then in that case is difference between this sigma 1 minus sigma 2 equal to sigma y and that is as per the, the in, in case of the plane stress condition. So, here when uh, one component is subjected to uh, say the this thing the different loading condition. So, there uh, we represent this uh, at the, the representative volume we can say we can take an element and that element is subjected to different types of the shear stress and normal stress component, but we can convert to the normal stress and shear stress in terms of the principal stress component and that principal based on the principal stress components we can decide the criteria yield doing will occur the we can set some criteria but here the Tereshka's yield criteria is basically setting that when there is a shearing will occur between the two two different layer that indicates the the Tereshka condition condition so we, we, as per this condition we reach that this uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 2 equal to sigma this is the yielding criteria but we are always try to link with the sigma y is the yield stress value because using the uniaxial uni tensile testing we can measure the yield stress value, but maybe and that is the, um, the yield stress value or that is under the, the, same, the one dimensional set of the stress in, in that case. So, uniaxial tensile stress is basically measure the yield stress. So, always that is a measurable quantity that is why we link with the all the criteria in terms of the yield stress value. So, this is the one, the second is the one versus yield condition, it follows the maximum distortion energy criteria. So, based on this criteria we reach certain expression, we link the what is the principal stress or what can be the yielding condition can be applied here. So, plastic flow stress will occur when the shear strain energy reaches a critical value. So, because we calculate the what is the total shear strain energy the associated during the deformation process and based on that we see when it is reaching the some critical value then we based on that we put the conditions for the one Mrs. Hill condition. So, maximum shear stress which is critical value we can estimate the strain energy is like that 1 by 6 is equal to in terms of the principal stress components sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3. But remember this principal stress components we have calculated but it, it is it depends on the sigma x, sigma y. Uh, sigma z on a particular material and tau x y y z and tau z x. So, it is all stress components are involved and we see the expression of the uh, principal stress component is actually as a function of the all uh, st stress component. So, therefore, that we representing is the in terms of the principal stress component. So, that is why we can calculate the strain energy in terms of the principal stress components or even we can calculate the strain energy in terms of the the initial state of the stress components. I mean to say that it can be in terms of the sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, tau x y, tau y z, tau z x that also be possible. But then it easy to calculate in terms of the principal uh, stress component. So, when you say calculate the strain energy, then we can say that the this form of this curve or this uh, this thing it is a this kind of expression we see the sigma 1 minus sigma 2 square plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 square minus plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 is equal to 6 g. This is a constant value. Now, here you see the plastic flow depends on the all stress component. Here see that all the plastic flow involve all the three principal stress component which is different from the stress cause ill conditions. Now, if it is a plane stress condition the in, in that case sigma 3 equal to 0. So, we can reach this expression sigma y square minus sigma 1 sigma 2 plus sigma 1 square square root of that is equal to sigma y. This is the uh, von Mises ill conditions. Uh, in case of the plane stress condition. So, which are different if you see this is the for this is the plane stress condition for stress yield condition and this is for the as per the von Mises ill condition. We can further discuss on this thing uh, von Mises ill condition we will get more details about this thing. Now, we see the relation between the tensile and the shear st strain component. So, when you perform the 
uniaxial tensile testing, we see that uh, we have already written that as per the voin meshes stress, we can the sigma 1 minus sigma 2 square plus sigma 2 minus sigma 3 square plus sigma 3 minus sigma 1 square, some constant value. Now, this is the uh, yield surface, yield surface defined by the burn meshes conditions, we can get this as the yield surface. Now, what can be the values of the C? C can be like that, C can we can get it from the uniaxial tensile testing data. So, when we perform the uniaxial tensile testing, maybe we see that sigma 1 reaches the sigma y because only one dimensional stress will be there, but sigma 2, sigma 3 are 0. If we put this condition in this expression, we are getting the C equal to is basically twice sigma y square. So, this is the uh, bond misses yield conditions, we are getting that sigma 1 and uh, sigma 2 uh, in, in, in this cases, it will be the twice sigma y square. This is the, the yield criteria as per the bond misses condition. But sometimes we can represent all these things in terms of the, this is the normal yield strength, but in terms of the shear yield strength, we can represent this thing. So, in that cases, we need to relation between the normal yield strength and the shear yield strength value. Now, if we suppose we measure the yield point and the condition is the pure shear condition, pure shearing condition the state of the stress will be like that sigma 1 equal to tau y for example, sigma 1 equal to tau y, sigma 2 equal to 0, but sigma 3 equal to minus tau y. So, this indicates the pure shear condition. So, where tau y is the shear yield strength, the shear yield strength is different from the normal yield strength. So, therefore, if you put it the conditions for the the yielding under in the von Mises condition here, if you put it, this condition will be getting the C equal to is basically 6, 6 tau y square you will be getting. So, here we see that when you follow, uh, when you have the experimental data normal yield strength value, then you are getting constant C equal to twice tau y square, but when you are having the shear yield strength value, you are getting the constant C equal to 6 tau y square. So, I can say that 6 tau y square should be equal to twice sigma y square. This is the relation between the shear yield strength. So, here you can getting the tau y equal to sigma y square by 3. So, tau y will be the square root of this. So, basically uh, sorry uh, sigma y square. So, it means the sigma y by root 3. So, we are getting the this is relation between the shear yield strength and normal yield strength, but this is as per the when you are following the ill criteria following the one versus uh, condition. So, here this is the way to represent this thing relation between these two shear yields and normal yield strength and but if you follow the Tedesca's yield condition in that case is the shear yield strength is basically is the half of the uh, sigma y by 2. So, this is the, the relation between the shear state to the normal stress value as per the Tedesca's uh, condition. So, these are the two different condition and we can apply this uh, rule. Are uh, different uh, to understand the plastic deform state of the plastic deformation state in the deformation process uh, during the metal forming operation. Now, come to this point that uh, forming and forming operation, what way we can uh, understand the forming operation in practically in this thing. So, usually we started with the forming operation in the semi finished uh, product. So, semi finished product they are having the different kind of the shape. So, that is basically casted into this component, but we start with the semi finished product uh, component and then we deform this component as per requirement and uh, deform means when you deform it, it basically forming operation you have need to follow. Now, we start with the different the slab, ingot, billet, bloom, these are the different form of the initial component semi finished product which is usually come from the uh, after following the casting operation. They are different definition. The ingot is the first solid form of the steel. Steel in the form of ingot, we get it. The first we get it in the ingot of the from, from a casting unit. Now, from the ingot, we can make it the bloom. So, some particular cross section we can deform, and uh, this thing it's maybe the square cross section bloom. And then we can from the ingot we can directly create in the case of the form of the billet. Billet can be the from the bloom it can billet can be formed. So by hot rolling operation, we can this thing it is another type of the square cross section we can get and usually the side are larger and we can make it the slab also is the hot roll ingot or bloom. So, from the ingot or bloom we can convert to the slab 
the shape which is having rectangular cross section 10 inch or more wide and 1.5 meter or more thick. So, depending on the different shape we can convert. So, all this conversation from the semiphonic product or from ingot to the different shape of the component which is performed through the metal forming operations. Now, there is also another component which is the this uh, the mill product we usually say like that mill product we can say the different shape of the plate. Plate is produced which is less than good, greater than 5 millimeter thickness and then sheet is produced with thickness between the 5 millimeter to 600 millimeter through the just to deform the material following some metal forming operation. And finally, strip can be produced the thickness less than 5 millimeter and with less than 600 millimeter. So, different shape we can produce through the metal forming operation which is finally used for the uh, different component. So, this way we can we can we can get the different uh, um, the different deform component or metal forming component we just use the further manufacturing process to get an end product. Here you can some understanding of the rolling operation which is one of the metal forming operation we can we can see that we use the relatively higher thickness of the work this is the input to the system and there is a uh, two rotating wheel are there which in contact with the, the metal and then after the controlling the gap between the two roller we can reduce the thickness of the material in this case the thickness of the workpiece so different thickness. So, this is simply rolling operation we see the thickness of the slab or plate can be reduced through the rolling operation by using the two opposing cylindrical rolls. Now, the rolls rotate such that it will try to draw into the work gap. If you see the squeeze it, so I mean to say that if you see the roll, the, the thickness is much higher in this case, the starting material, but thickness is lower in this case. But in the rolling operation, we, we in, in, uh, when the, in, the velocity can be different here because what is the velocity is input to this thing and what is the output velocity of, of the strip are completely different because we need to maintain the the conservation of the total volume of the material. So, if you try to, to apply the conservation law, so definitely the here the cross section in, in input cross section A1 and here velocity V1 that should be equal to the A2 the cross section output from this after rolling and V2. So, definitely output cross section is less, so velocity will be much more. So, strip velocity will be much more. So, input and output velocity of the strip are different in this particular process. Now, based on the recrystallization temperature, we can see the there is a static recrystallization, dynamic recrystallization or recrystallization will usually happens over a range of the temperature. So, based on that, we can say whether it is a hot rolling operation or whether it is cold ro rolling operation. So, rolling operation techniques are the same, but the this workpiece sample can be performed, the deformation can, can be performed at the high temperature or it can be performed at the low temperature and based on that we can say whether it is hot rolling operation or whether it is the cold rolling operation. So, of course, there are different types of the rolling operation, ring lowering, roll bearing, roll forming. So, we will try to discuss when you try to explain the different rolling operation in the bulk deformation process. Now, if you look into the mechanics of the rolling process, we see there are the two different things are there. Of course, we already mentioned the in entry velocity and exit velocity are different in the rolling operation, the strip will be different. But uh, there might be something, some intermediate velocity which is comply with the velocity of the roller. So, roller velocity should be the in between the because roller is basically in contact with the strip and if you try to minimize the slip between the workpiece and the roller. So, roller velocity should be in between the input velocity, entry velocity and the exit velocity. So, that is why we see this is the exit velocity is much more with respect to the input velocity or velocity of the roller should be in between these two. And based on this thing, so when roller velocity is in between exit and input velocity. So, uh, in this case at this particular point where, where the velocity of the roller and velocity of the strip should be equal. So, at this particular point it is called the neutral point. So, neutral point the roller velocity and the strip velocity will be equal, but in other part there is must be some kind of the slip between the roller and the, the strip. So, that slip must be there. So, that means there is a difference in the velocity of the roller and the strip must be exist in between, but one particular point where both the velocity will be the same the strip velocity and the roller velocity. So, that part is 
considered as a neutral point associated with the rolling operation. But at the same time, if you see the before and after with, with respect to the neutral point, the uh, entry site and the exit site, since there are relative velocities are there and the one case is uh, it's a relative velocity is positive, other cases relative velocity is negative. So, there may be directional changes. So, in that sense, the friction between the roller and the workpiece will be the there will be changing their sign. So, one side it is the with respect to the neutral point. Similarly, pressure distribution can be a function of the geometric parameters. We can we see the geometric parameters, the strip thickness, what is the roller radius, all these parameters actually decide the distribution of the pressure over the roller during the deformation of this thing. So, sometimes it is also necessary to calculate what is the total force is acting on the roller such that we put the we can put the rigidity of the system to able to sustain this particular roll operating forces. So, that is the for the design purpose we need to calculate what is the total forces exerted by the strip during this operation. So, to do that we need to understand what is the distribution of the pressure between the roller and the and the strip within this thing. So, we will calculate it is possible to calculate the the pressure distribution based on that we can calculate what is the total rolling forces. Now, in this cases usually the both the if you use the very symmetric structure. So, definitely both the roller velocity should be the same rotational velocity of the roller should be the same and the same also the same circumferential velocity and their radius should be the same in this cases for the both the rolling operation. So, this is just to different phenomena associated with the a rolling process. Now, if you look into the forging operation also, in forging operation the workpiece is basically compressed between the two parallel dies. Okay. So, in that case you see there are two parallel die the workpiece is forced we just put simply compressive load we apply using the two die. So, within the die the workpiece is deformed and they take the shape based on the shape of the die usually. But in this case definitely some localized compressive forces is basically required, but we can create this particular forces using the hammering by hammer also it is also possible. So, similarly we see that uh, when you try to deform the very hard material say for example, the steel. So, when try to deform the steel definitely the die material should be strength of the die material should be much more as compared to the steel hardness level will be much more as compared to the steel and therefore, and, and you can understand that how much force can be required just to deform the steel. So, therefore, based on that this this process also can be classified as the cold forming, hot forming and the and the warm forming also operation. So, depending upon the application of the temperature uh, for the to the workpiece material just to facilitate the deformation of the material. Now, but overall we can see the forging force we applying the load forging force is usually much more the maximum value at the end of the operation. So, we see that if you remember that uh, this uh, in the stress strain curve of a particular material the strain versus stress just to reaching the ultimate tensile strain. So, there is a strain hardening effect. So, it needs with the gradually applies much the deformation occurs at the, the when the deformation at the last stage of the deformation we need the maximum large amount of the stress and this happens because of the strain hardening effect of this particular material. So, that means if we try to deform so they are applying the load so the, the material becomes deformed gradually and at the and the, and the strain hardening effect means the slope is this slope, slope is positive. So, if you take this particular reach this particular deformation stage we need much amount of the stress. Similarly, when you try to reach this particular level of the deformation we reach maximum amount of the uh, stress value. But that is very obvious from the because metal is just gradually uh, the metal is having the strain hardening effect. So, definitely at the last stage of the deformation we need the maximum amount of the force during the forging operation. Of course, during the deformation process we, we try to ensure that the all the component all the part of the material try to deform the, the plastically. So, uh, but sometimes it is very difficult to maintain the uniform plastic deformation of the throughout the uh, contact. So, accordingly we can design the die or other kind of the uh, parameters or we measure or um, consider during the deformation by the forging operation. But there is another aspect during the forging operation. So, of course, when you try to deform the material, so there must be some kind of the uh, at the interface 
so there must be some kind of the slip to occurs between the workpiece and the 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 deformed material so in that cases most of the cases forging operation we try to understand what is the the sliding friction and the the sticking friction usually occurs associated with the any kind of forging of a uh, strip so sticking friction uh, depending upon this thing the friction nature of the friction so some cases that uh, when there is a, a sliding friction so sliding friction means the uh, complete uh, relatively the the velocity easily happens the the without uh, sticking with the workpiece material during the de deformation sticking with the uh, this die material during the deformation so when there is no sticking just sliding with respect to each other during the deformation so that can be treated as a sliding friction and we apply the sliding friction is the in this cases the at per the coulomb's law of friction so we can uh, f equal to we know this mu into r with the r is the this the reaction force and the total friction force is the mu into r but in this case we we represent in the form of a stress not the form of a uh, absolute values of the load rather if the, when you try to represent in terms of the stress so tau equal to mu into p so mu is the coefficient of the friction and p is the pressure so, so the, here instead of the load we represent the in the pressure and instead of the it is the represent the shear stress because it is the shearing will happen between the two components so it terms in terms of the the shear stress value so this the sliding friction representing this way but during the deformation it is maybe possibility that the deformed mat that material during deformation the stick with the material stick with the die material so when the sticking condition exists then it needs to overcome for the deform of the material the the shear yields point value so therefore we can say the 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 shear st the stress here the shear stress will be the shear illustration value so here sigma x is actually representing the shear illustration not the normal illustration we do not confuse with this thing the sigma is basically i have clearly written it is the shear illustration value so the shear stress will be the in this cases the shear stress will be the shear illustration value that indicates this is the sticking friction condition so sometimes if we try to design the process we calculate what is the force required just to deform the material we can uh, in that cases we can assume the the both uh, we can incorporate the sticking and the sliding friction condition as during the deformation operation now there is extrusion process also one of the uh, metal forming operation we, we can see the extrusion process in that cases we see from the figure that workpiece material is there and the in this case deformation is the similar to the drawing operation drawing means we can uh, we are not uh, that means it is uh, through the material is coming through the particular die opening so material is coming through this die opening but load is applied from the compressive load is applied from the other side so here this the ram and from here we can apply the compressive load here and this material is come out through the die opening so through the die opening so therefore the shape of the component will be depending upon the cross sectional area uh, of the die so that's why so here application of the load from the back side and we apply the compressive load to the component so here material is forced uh, basically with the application of the compressive uh, uh, load material is forced to come through the die opening so that's why it takes the particular shape of the die and this is usually called as the extrusion process so therefore very complex cross section can be possible using the in the uh, extrusion process but at the same time because we are apply, applying the compressive load so at least when you try to handle the brittle material then it is better handle that to some extent the brittle material is the better handle with the application of the compressive load rather than the application of the tensile load so therefore uh, we see that's why the in extrusion process the brittle material can be operated because brittle material can be able to sustain more amount of the the compressive load as compared to the tensile loading because mostly compressive stress and of course in this cases and some point this metal can be subjected to the shear stress uh, will also be can see during the de deformation process of the extrusion operation but extrusion operation can also be both it is also possible the hot and cold working process is possible which is associated with the extrusion process now you can see simple calculation of the extrusion process also we can we can we can just to overview of this process what we can apply the this thing continuity equation the we can say that 
conservation of the volume flow rate is possible here. So, how to maintain the continuity equation is that. So, here the cross section area we can either this, this we are applying the load and the velocity of the ram. So, velocity of the ram is the vr. So, velocity of the ram equal to vr and the cross section this cross section area of the ram equal to say di is the diameter. So, we can say the pi by 4 di square into vr. So, that indicates the total volume flow rate in this cases because cross section area say si unit is the meter square and the velocity is say meter per second. So, which is equivalent to the meter cube per second. So, volume flow rate is there calculate, but the same volume flow rate will be maintained in the output here you can see the the velocity will be different here. So, here suppose velocity equal to v and cross section area of the die is basically say diameter d. So, pi by 4 d square into v this should be equal and we see since cross section are different. So, therefore, velocity will be different. So, definitely the exit velocity from the die component the velocity will be much more as compared to the what is the velocity of the ram the which velocity we are performing the extrusion operation. So, that is why we can we can but volume conservation will always be continuity equation will always be maintained. So, from there we can relate between these two velocity component. Now, we can see the what is the work done per unit volume we can simply calculate uh, from this thing the st state of the stress and uh, strain the integration of this thing. So, this we can see the state of the stress will be varying with uh, like that. So, strain and the stress value. So, anyway the work done per unit volume is basically area of this thing. This area is basically integration 0 to, uh, 0 to epsilon. So, suppose this is the strain of the epsilon component sigma d epsilon that indicates the area of this curve and that is actually representation of the work done per unit volume. Now, sometimes you can calculate what is the, the strain component here you can see they have written the strain equal to logarithm of a i and a f c. This is the a i is the this cross section area and a f is the outer cross section area. We can see that a i say a i l i total volume and a f l f is the uh, final volume. So, that is the, the plastic deformation in, in during the plastic deformation that will also be maintained here. So, here we know the strain equal to the true strain equal to ln lf by li this is the expression for the true strain. So, here you can see the ln lf by li is corresponding to the ai by af. So, I have written this one ai by af that is indicate the true strain during the deformation process. So, we can simply calculate the strain value here in terms of the just cross section area because cross section area is well defined. So, we simply calculate what is the strain here in this case. So, we know that a i equal to uh, basically pi by 4 d i square and a f equal to pi by 4 d f square. So, that is why we can calculate from there that 2 of uh, 2 into logarithm of d i by d f this is the strain component. Now, assuming that during the deformation total the throughout the deformation the average values of the stress which is equivalent to the yield stress is basically maintained. So, I mean to say that during the deformation one constant values of the stress is maintained. So, that is which is equivalent to the sigma y for example. So, in that if it this is the situation then we can easily calculate the 0 to the total work done sigma dy, but sigma is over the deformation epsilon the, it is a constant. So, sigma you replace the sigma y and integration of d epsilon equal to only epsilon. So, therefore, epsilon equal to twice ln di by df we put it twice ln di by df into sigma y. So, simple calculation we can find out this thing the deformation ok. So, we calculate and of course, deformation per unit time also we can calculate deformation is just simply the pi by 4 di square we already calculate deformation per unit time in terms of the volume. Now, we can calculate the power used in the plastic deformation what is the total power used in the plastic deformation. So, we can simply hear the work done per unit volume and multiply by the what is the uh, deformation per unit unit uh, unit time. So, work done wp is basically meter cube by second per unit time uh, and or, uh, sorry work done per unit uh, volume. So, it can be sorry it can be joule per meter cube calculator and then deformation per unit time it is a meter cube per second. So, it basically meter cube meter cube joule per second it can be equivalent to the watt. You can see the WP per unit volume and this is the volume flow rate or maybe deformation per uh, unit time we can say or in terms of the 
the what is the total volume deformed per unit time multiply by that indicates the power used in the plastic deformer so very straightforward or simple way we can calculate what is the power required to deform the material uh, this is a rough calculation we can we, we can do in a in a extrusion process similarly we can look into the drying operation also this is another uh, important the deformation um, process in the drying operation is the similar to the extrusion process but you see that here also changing the cross section this is the work is one cross section we can reach the another cross section but here instead of applying the load using the ram we just pull it we can apply the tensile loading from the front so here we are applying the load so the application of the load are different in these two cases extrusion and the drying operation but in principle the deformation state of the deformation are the same now here you see that instead of the compressive load we apply the tensile load and we can see the in drawing operation we can apply the multiple stage it may not be possible to reduce the from one diameter to another diameter in a single stage we can perform the multiple stage to reduce the diameter further and here also we can calculate the similar way the two strain equal to ln ai by af uh, in this case here also but we see I have written one term that is the D. D is the degree of drawing operation which is can be defined degree of drawing operation is defined by the what was the initial because here is the initial cross section area and here is the final cross section area. So, here A i minus A f with respect to A i that actually indicates the, the degree of the drawing operation. So, here D i square by minus D f square by D i so is 1 minus D f by D i. So, therefore, this is equivalent to the, so we can say the df by di square is basically 1 minus d. So, from here di by df square equal to 1 by 1 minus d. So, here you see a i by, um, uh, in this case di by df square equal to this one, 2 strain um, df by d i ok. So, d i by d f is equal to square equal to 1 by 1 minus d. So, here we see that uh, a i is basically a i uh, equal to d i square by d f square. So, from here we can see the d i by d f square equal to 1 by d. So, we can find out the logarithm of 1 by 1 minus d. So, this is the in case of the drawing operation, we can perform the similar kind of the exercise, what we can explain the extrusion process. Now, there are few things which can be uh, explained in case associated with the deformation process that uh, what are the heat transfer simply we can link with the deformation process. Now, already you understand that based on the working temperature, we can see it is a cold forming process, the hot forming process, warm forming process all these things, but very precisely we can define the cold forming process, the temperature is very close to the room temperature that that is called the cold forming operation. Then warm forming means the between the room temperature to the recrystallization temperature which can be approximately 30 percent of the melting point temperature, this is usually is called the warm forming operation or I can say the warm forming between the hot uh, working and the cold working temperature that is called the uh, warm forming operation. Then hot forming operation above the recrystallization temperature it is usually working temperature is roughly 50 percent to the 70 percent of the melting point temperature that is called the hot forming operation. So, that means in this particular temperature the deformation uh, can uh, usually occurs. Now, definitely when you try to handle the deformation we apply the mechanical loading of a particular component and that mechanical loading helps to plastically deform the material. So, some part of the applied energy due to the because when you work done to the system when you try to deform because you are applying the mechanical load. So, that will perform some kind of the in terms of the work done total amount of the work done is applying to the system. So, that work done is helps to plastically deform the material, but at the same time some amount of the fraction of the energy will be converted to the heat energy. So, definitely you see if you do the, but that heat energy depends on the uh, the strain usually most of the in the case it depends on the strain rate for how fast you are deforming material. So, if we observe after the deformation there is a some temperature rise of the component. So, it means that some of the mechanical energy you are applying this is converted to the heat energy. So, that heat energy is responsible to increase the temperature during the deformation process. Now, what we can calculate the simply way we can calculate the increment of the 
this temperature during the deformation process. So, that is the objective of this particular uh, uh, subtopic. So, here C plastic deformation and interfacial friction energy is also there. So, because of that not only plastic deformation there are some interfacial frictional energy between the die and the workpiece. So, some friction will be there. So, this friction will also be uh, here the helpful to raise the temperature of the component along with the plastic deformation. Now, we see we see the in that way the suppose the state of the temperature can be like that. So, heat dissipation in what is the total at uh, the state of the temperature T which is component of the uh, before deformation it was having some initial temperature. So, that is called we can say that T i is the initial temperature and delta T d is the temperature rise due to the plastic deformation. We can say that delta T d is the corresponds to the what is the temperature rise due to the plastic deformation. Then delta T f the temperature rise due to the friction and finally, these are the temperature rise, but at the same time when the component is there some uh, it is subjected to the formation of the temperature, but at the same time there is some temperature difference between the surrounding atmosphere and the already heated workpiece. So, therefore, there must be some amount of the heat loss from the heated uh, workpiece to the surface. So, that mode of the heat loss will be because of the convection and the radiation. But of course, the temperature is probably the very lower side though radiation heat loss will be there, but extent of the radiation heat loss will be very low. So, so these are the different temperature component we make the total temperature the state of the temperature is that uh, uh, this particular during the deformation process. Now, we can calculate what is the temperature rise due during the due to the deformation energy we can simply calculate this thing. Now, based on the energy or work done. So, let us start with this thing we can calculate what is we apply some mechanical load. So, we can calculate what is the total amount of the plastic work done during the deformation we can see the per unit volume. We can see simply sigma into stress into strain because stress to strain because in this case we are assuming that the stress over the deformation stress is constant. So, when or say average stress value we are considering which is average stress value which is constant throughout the deformation stress of the deformation. So, when you are considering like that, so in the what is the amount of the stress component and what is the strain that actually indicates the what is the work done due to the deformation. So, I have written sigma into epsilon. So, that is the total plastic work done per unit volume. Now, if you multiply by the total volume, so it indicates the total work plastic work done. Now, assuming that considering alpha as a fraction of the plastic work done, which is basically responsible for the generation of the heat. So, all the mechanical work cannot be converted to the, the uh, heat energy. So, the some fraction of the mechanical energy will be converted to the heat energy. So, we just introduce the count this as a fraction which is the fraction of the plastic work done is responsible for the heat generation. So, therefore, in this case total plastic work done can be multiplied by the alpha if you see alpha into sigma epsilon this thing. Now, during this deformation for example, total plastic work done for this what responsible for the temperature of the uh, due to the deformation. So, this is the total work done. Now, suppose this work done will be the in the form of a, uh, the internal energy stored in terms of the temperature difference. So, internal energy stored within the workpiece, the thermal energy stored within the workpiece we can calculate m mass Cp specific heat m Cp into delta T. So, that is the specific heat and delta T is the change in the temperature due to the deformation energy. So, we can calculate simply using this part. Now, equating this thing make this balance. So, this is the plastic work done fraction of the plastic work done is basically responsible for the rise of the temperature and other side we can keep what is the heat energy is uh, in, in this particular process. So, make it equal and we can calculate what is the delta T d is basically in terms of the other parameters. But here in terms of the strain here, but we can see that is the strain rate also can be calculated the strain rate equal to. So, uh, strain rate equal to d epsilon by d t so, or other we can say the epsilon by t is the basically uh, strain rate. So, we can count the time total time. So, in terms of the strain rate also if we measure only the strain rate. So, in terms of the strain rate also we can calculate what is the temperature rise due to the deformation. So, this way we can simply we can calculate the deformation. Now, we can see what is the temperature rise due to the friction also because some amount of the heat rise will be due to the friction between the die and the workpiece or sample. 
Now frictional energy overcome the between the tool and the workpiece definitely. So here the friction is happening due to the we see the when we are applying the uh, sticking friction sliding friction we see there is a friction happen due to the sharing action. So in that case uh, total frictional energy we can calculate what is the the total the shear force shear force uh, between this layer the shear force layer and what is the velocity of the flow flow of the material. So what is the shear force and the velocity of the flow in the same direction we can calculate this is the amount of the total uh, uh, shear uh, energy is basically the I think the, the frictional energy. So tau into area so shear stress and the area should be counted which is parallel to the shear stress. So that area we multiply this thing it indicates total shear force and velocity velocity multiplied by the velocity of the flow that indicates the total uh, frictional energy. So now we can see this is the frictional energy but we can simply modulate in this case that shear stress we can assuming the in this case the shear stress frictional shear stress in the basically n into n is some some shear factor we can introduce into tau y tau y is the shear stress value so you see the when you're talking the sticking condition this is the maximum amount of the shear stress value the tau y the shear yield strength value but it's not necessary that always it put the the complete the sticking usually happens so it's some some kind of the the in between the the sliding and the sticking condition usually happens uh, in this case so that can be introduced just by incorporating on the shear factor the shear factor the n is the shear factor which can be between 0 to 1 so it means that it's if it is a 1 this is a completely the complete uh, sliding condition is basically uh, sorry complete sticking condition is uh, prevailing in this cases so when n equal to 1 and when n equal to 0 then source stress equal to 0 so that means in that cases we are not considering uh, we need to consider the uh, sliding friction condition so that's why in this way we can say that some intermediate stage we say in terms of the sticking condition but n can take care of the uh, uh, the value can take care of the some intermediate stage between the sliding and the sticking condition or certain part of the the sticking condition associated with the the friction deformation so shear strength velocity we can area quantity we can easily calculate now what is the making the energy balance this is the frictional energy we see frictional energy m is the say suppose this over the time t in this case so wf into t uh, that is indicates the uh, the wf I into t indicates the uh, this thing we just to making the energy balance uh, wf multiplied by the time is equivalent to the mcp delta t because mcp delta t the mass specific heat and the increment of the temperature and they here see uh, let us look into what can be the unit of this thing that shear strength is basically newton per meter square shear stress area in the meter square but here we use the velocity of the flow meter per second so when you are calculating this one is the newton meter joule per second so basically in terms of the watt or energy per unit time you are calculating so actually frictional energy you are calculating per unit time that is why we multiply by the time t here uh, that becomes in terms of the SI unit it can be joule and right hand side also it can be in terms of the joule mcp delta tf so from here you can calculate what is the delta tf in terms of the other parameters so once we calculate these two deformation the increment of the temperature be these two and we can then understand what are the the state of the temperature uh, simply because in this case if you see only we are calculating these two component but we can calculate what is the loss of the temperature uh, due to the convection and radiation if we calculate this one and finally we can estimate what is the state of the temperature during the deformation process. Now overall you can see that if you look into that because we see uh, overall we see the cold and hot working operation associated with this thing operation but we see that cold working is basically room temperature where hot working is usually happens between the 50 to 70 percent of the melting point temperature. But if you see the load required in the cold working operation it relatively high as compared to the hot working process because cold working is happening at the room temperature. So definitely strain hardening effect will be much more in case of the cold working condition. So that is why you need much amount of the load during the cold working condition. Now if you observe these things that the elongated grain during the deformation we observe uh, uh, associated with the metal forming operation but cold working uh, elongated grains cold working while equiaxed grains 
uh, in this case, elongated gains we can find out in the cold working because our uh, elongated gains we can equiaxed kind of the gains we can find out in the hot working condition because in hot working condition that creates the most favorable condition for the recrystallization to occur. So, that is why you can get more equiaxed grain if recrystallization occurs that is why most of the hot working operation we can expect the the equiax kind of the grains but in case of the cold working condition we see there is the energy will be the store energy will not be released or even if there is a release there is a partially recovery of the material might happen or some cases some partial recrystallization might happen just to release a uh, certain part of the energy during the cold deformation so therefore in the cold working condition we can expect the elongated grain elongated mean the the stored energy will be much more in this particular case which is not released through the re completely released through the recrystallization to happen. So, here is the differences. Of course, strength of the cold work material is relatively higher as compared to the hot work material because hot work material means recrystallization happens in that cases it completely deform uh, completely new uh, grain almost strain free grains usually occurs. So, that is why obstacles for the dislocation movement is not much when in the hot work component but in the cold work component it is not exactly the strain free grains we can get. So, therefore, in that cases there may be some obstacle for the movement of the dislocation. So, that is why strength of the cold work material will be relatively higher. Now, but ductility of the cold work material is relatively low and as compared to the hot work material because uh, cold work material is the, the strength level is much more. So, so if the deformation is a little bit difficult in case of the cold work. So, therefore, ductility level for the cold work material is relatively low as compared to the hot work material. So, already mentioned the dislocation density in the cold work material is that uh, more in the cold work material, but less in case of the uh, hot work material because hot work material there passes through the recrystallization just to release the total energy. So, dislocation density will also be less in associated with the hot work material. So, definitely that is why most of the cases that we perform the annealing operation in the cold work material because after performing the cold work material there is a deformed grain. So, store energy is there, but when you perform the annealing operation in the cold work material it will through recrystallization it release the amount of the stored energy. So, that is why and gets more stable structure is formed almost strain free structure is formed after recrystallization. So, that is why after cold work it is mandatory to perform some kind of the annealing operation just to release the stored energy and to form a new recrystallized grain in the in the component. So, this way after to explain the get the overall view of the uh, the metal forming operations and what are the different associated phenomena associated with the uh, metal forming operation that means what we can incorporate simply we incorporate the temperature effect we can calculate what is the increment of the temperature just simply uh, understanding the simple stress strain diagram to calculate the what is the work done associated with this uh, process. I think that is all for the time being. Thank you very much for your kind attention.